Thank you, uh, Pastor Wimbing, for the very warm and kind uh, welcome and introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, let me introduce myself. Hello, my name is Stephen, and I'm a Master of Divinity student at BGST. Uh, and I'm so glad to be able to do my few education here at Bethany and to get to know many of you. And I look forward to getting to know uh, many of you who have not have an opportunity to talk to as well. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank uh, the leadership here, especially the elders and the pastors, for giving me the opportunity to share the Word of God with you. And it is uh, also the church who have extended the grace and uh, favour of God to me as well. So I'm very grateful and um, I'm here to share the Word of God with you and hope that it will encourage you. So today we're going to continue with the sermon series entitled Lessons from the King's Faithfulness and Failures by looking at King Jehu in 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10. So let us prepare our hearts in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your grace and presence here today. Father, we ask, O oh God, that you will open our spiritual eyes to see, open our spiritual ears to hear, and open our hearts to receive what you want to speak to us through your word. Father, we also pray that you will give us the courage and the will to act in obedience that our life may glorify you in our thought, word, and deed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Duplicity, hypocrisy, hidden sin, a double life, wearing a mask, numerous lies, masquerading as light, but on the inside, ravenous wolf, all along, all these while. You know, two months ago, Pastor Wenbing shared with us the tragic story of the late Ravi Zacharias. You know, after his death and after a thorough investigation, it's found that he has repeatedly engaged in sexual misconduct with multiple women over an extended period of time. You know, this news shocked and rocked a large part of the Christian world. But what is exceptionally troubling is not just the extent of his sins, they are exceptionally troubling in and of themselves, but that these scenes did not surface, was unreported, unnoticed for so long until after his death. You know, while Ravi Zacharias all these while has been revered as a godly representative of Christ and his, and his influence extended far and wide, you know, a senior pastor of a church in Singapore concluded after reflecting over the entire saga that the duplicity and hypocrisy of Ravi Zacharias fooled everyone except perhaps his victims. And I would add, he definitely did not fool God. Today we are going to look at one of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel, King Jehu. And we will find this story tragically similar in many ways. You know, king Jehu was anointed by God to be king and was given divine sanction to overthrow Ahab, his house, Jezebel, and to purge Baal worship from the land. You know, as one of the human embodiments of idolatry and wickedness, Jezebel persuaded King Ahab to introduce Baal worship, a form of idol worship, to Israel. Moreover, she persecuted many of God's prophets, Elijah being the most famous one. And she also murdered numerous innocent people, including Naboth, whose vineyard she and King Ahab stole via a land grab. But here comes King Jehu. Through conspiracy, Jehu lured King Joram, the then king of uh, Israel, the son of King Ahab, out to meet him. But when they meet, King Jehu drew his bow at full strength and shot an arrow right through his heart and killed him. King Ahaziah, who is the then king of Judah, the southern kingdom, was also there and happened to be caught in the fray. So he too was fatally injured and he too died of his injuries later on. After taking out the king of Israel, Jehu went after the queen mother Jezebel herself. When Jezebel met King Jehu, she defiantly and mockingly, you know, sneered at him, 
at that point, King Jehu commanded his men to throw Jezebel out of the building and she died a gruesome death. So after taking out the leaders of Israel's idolatry, Jehu went after Ahab's descendants, the house of Ahab. He threatened their servants by writing letters to them, asking them to behave their master's son. And upon receiving those letters, the servants immediately massacred all of the king's sons and relatives. King Jehu also went after the relatives of Ahaziah. So while he was en route to take out the remaining of the house of King Ahab, Ah King Ahaziah's uh, descendants were also killed by King Jehu. Lastly, Jehu rounded up all the prophets of Baal by lying to them that he wants to offer a great sacrifice to the Baal God. So once all the false prophets gathered together, Jehu commanded the men to put them to the sword and even turn the temple of Baal into a latrine, a toilet. You know, upon review of all that I have shared, wow, the mighty acts of King Jehu were a clean sweep, a resounding victory for God and for Israel. By taking out King Ahab, his house, the idolatrous house of King Ahab, Jezebel, and purge Baal worship from the land. What an incredible king King Jehu was, tearing down the false gods of Baal and removing idolatry from the land. And we might think King Jehu must have gone down in history as one of the good kings of Israel, comparable to the likes of King David, King Hezekiah, and King Josiah. But the question is, did he? In fact, he did not. How can that be? It is to Jehu's credit and obedience to God, right, that he taken out King Jehab, the house, Jezebel, and purged Baal idolatry from the land. When we get to 2 Kings 10, 28 and 29, we hear this from the Bible. Does Jehu wipe out Baal from Israel? But Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. That is, the golden calves that were in battle and in them. Wait a minute. What did 2 Kings 10, 29 say? Uh, wh why did Jehu do that? Jehu removed Baal worship on one hand, but continued in golden calves worship which is just another form of idolatry worship, right? Verse 31 gives us more clue. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. What are the sins of Jeroboam? To answer that question, we need to turn our attention back to an earlier chapter, 1 Kings chapter 12, and we will read verse 27. If these people, referring to the northern kingdom of Israel, go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of these people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Jehoboam, king of Judah. So Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, after the united monarchy split. So when he controlled the northern kingdom, he stopped all pilgrimages to the Jerusalem temple, which is in the south, and established golden calf's worship, mimicking all the festival of Israel, right, to replace uh, Yahweh worship. Jeho Jeroboam would not allow any chance that his people's loyalties will swing to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. He wants to keep his people for himself. It is for political, self-centered, God-opposing reasons. And for King Jehu, this is likewise. So 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 29 and 31 reveals a plot twist. What seemed to be zeal for the Lord is actually a self-centered act. Jehu purged Israel from one form of idolatry but continued in another, 
So whatever it seems that he has done for the Lord, although there is divine sanction, was nothing more than for himself. Here comes my point number one. Personal disobedience can be disguised as religious activity. Personal disobedience can be disguised as religious activity. What seems to be well and good and godly can be a mask for covering up sin. We can appear to be religious, but the religious things that we do could well be for the wrong reasons. Let me illustrate this further with a story. Once upon a time, there was a farmer who grew an enormous carrot. He went and met his king and wanted to present this carrot to his king and he said to his king, Oh my lord, I have grew an enormous carrot and this is the largest carrot I have grown and will ever grow. Please take it and have it, for this is my token of love and respect for you. The king was touched and he discerned the man's heart. So when the gardener was about to go, the king said, wait, 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 right? You have been such a good steward of the earth. I have a plot of land beside your current garden and I want to give it to you to garden it all so that you can continue to do what you do. And the gardener was so amazed, so uh, grateful, he thanked the king and went away rejoicing. But, if, but there was a noble man at the king's court who overheard the conversation. And he said to himself, My, if that is what you can get for a carrot, what if I bring the king something better? So the next day, the noble man came before the king with a handsome black stallion. He bowed low and said to the king, My lord, I breed horses and I want to present it to you as a token of my love and respect for you. But the king discerned his heart and just said, thank you, and simply dismissed him. The noble man was of course perplexed, and the king said to him, and listen carefully, that gardener was giving me the carrot, but you were giving yourself the horse. That gardener was giving me the carrot, but you were giving yourself the horse. At the end of the day, what may seem to be for God's sake could well be for one's own sake. That is why, point number two, personal disobedience must be uncovered by self-examination. Personal disobedience must be uncovered by self-examination. It is only upon closer examination of our thoughts and our actions that our true motives will surface. So let's re-examine 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10, shall we? So we already saw that the pious actions earlier in the text, all the mighty acts of Jehu, actually mask Jehu's own self-serving motives. So now we need to go back to re-examine his motives for his action, like how we need to re-examine our motives for our actions. So more than self-centered motives, King Jehu actually deviated from divine warren as he carried out God's command. He actually went beyond what God has commanded. The scope of his actions is an overkill. Okay? How do we know that? Whenever there is a fulfillment of divine warren, meaning when God commanded something and it is fulfilled according to what God has commanded, you will read. Okay? For example, when King, a, uh, King Jerome was taken out, okay, you will read, in accordance with the word of the Lord. And then so on and so forth, you will read, this is the word of the Lord, according to the word of the Lord. And even for the purging of the Baal prophet, you see a precedence in the days of Elijah. So when there is a divine sanction, Something is done, there will be a divine fulfillment commentary according to the word of the Lord. Okay? However, when we come to Jehu's killing of King Ahaziah, who is the king of the south, and his descendants, okay, it is comparatively 
and stunningly silent. Nowhere was there divine sanction to take out the house of Judah, the house of King Ahaziah and his descendants, and therefore there will be no divine fulfillment commentary after they were killed. So in view of the deliberate inclusion to mark divine fulfillment, okay, the omission is very telling. King Jehu has gone beyond what God has commanded. Why? Now we know, because of his self-interest, political and whatnot, not obedience. And thus, upon re-examination, we see that his motives are not pure. And there's one more observation. There is another way we can see through Jehu. Let's examine the methods and the means by which he went about accomplishing God's will. So through conspiracy, sadistic methods, manipulation, deception, excessive violence, he tricked and trapped various ones into a gruesome bloodshed. King Jehu deployed such ungodly means and his wicked methods further reveal his self-centered motives upon re-examination. So, so much for King Jehu. What about us? What King Jehu, and of course on hindsight we reviewed earlier the late Ravi Zacharias, what they have committed as high-profile representatives of God are headline-grabbing in the ancient world today and we may easily dismiss them as simply exceptions. They are just that few bad apples among the mostly good ones and we are the good ones. But if we are honest with ourselves, are we above reproach? Are we always so pure in our motives, especially when we engage in Christian activity? We need to also examine ourselves. You know, at various points in my walk with God, God has mercifully provided me with opportunities for self-examination and I thank Him so much for that. And what's more, especially uh, in preparation for today's sermon, you know, and uh, several days ago, I was just talking to uh, Pastor Wen Ping that this is a dangerous sermon to preach. Okay. Over the years, God has given me many opportunities to serve Him. Uh, my work is usually among the young, uh, the young adults youth, and therefore youth camps, charity events, uh, zone district level meetings, uh, as a preacher, as an MC, as a camp commandant, head of programs, head of marketing, head of certain departments, etc. Through all these means and ways that I served God, I received encouragement, praise, and thereafter even more opportunities to continue to do what I seem to be doing very well. I also often make professions like, thank God, glory to God, I'm shining for Jesus. You know, and of course they look very well recorded on video for review. But upon deeper examination, deeper examination, I may not have said and done all those things with the purest of motives. The roles that I played, mentioned earlier, happened to be highly visible and they actually fed my ego. While I appear humble and godly, praise God, thank God, upon introspection, and retrospection, looking in, looking back, I was doing them to make myself feel good, look good, while at the same time, I overlooked many areas of my life that require self-denial, confession, and repentance. Personal disobedience was disguising itself as obedience. Personal disobedience was hiding behind what seems to be obedience. Self-interest was dressing up as godly interest. I thank God for His mercy and grace to see me thus far, but there is a continual need for self-examination even right here and right now, and there is no room for complacency for pride will eventually lead to destruction. So what about the rest of us, especially those of us who have been Christians for many, many years? These are some questions 
I put together to help us begin the journey of self-examination. Why do I serve the Lord and others? Is it out of self-interest or out of genuine love for God, His church and people? Why do I give to the church? Why do I give to Christian missions, Christian ministries or charitable causes? Do I appear benevolent, generous, kind to some while at the same time condescending towards others? For example, to waiters, cleaners, migrant workers and those generally despised by society. Are we two-faced? Do I appear godly in word and deed but could well be struggling with private sins that nobody knows and yet we always rationalise them away you know, we trivialize them, we play them down, we dilute them, sweep them under the carpet and simply do not want to deal with them. We need to examine ourselves to search out the motives. If not, our surface obedience will just be hiding deeper disobedience. The good news is, our lives and stories need not end like King Jehu, the northern kingdom of Israel, or like Ravi Zacharias. For that to happen, merely identifying the areas of our hidden disobedience or underlying sin is not enough. No diagnosis of a pathogen or disease without intervention is useless. We need intervention. In fact, we need divine intervention. Thank God for his gift of repentance and forgiveness provided in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this brings me to my third point, and it's important. Personal disobedience must be healed by forgiveness. Personal disobedience must be healed by forgiveness. The antidote to the poison of sin that drives us to hide more and more, to run away from God, to put up a holy but false front is the frequent, deep, tangible experience of God's forgiveness. We hide because we fear. We fear judgment. We fear rejection. We fear ridicule. But forgiveness is pardon. Forgiveness is release. Forgiveness is embrace. After discovering the darkness of our hearts and sins, we need the assurance and the courage provided by God's forgiveness to bring them out into the light so that we may be healed. Well, God has provided the means through which we can experience His forgiveness. And what are they? Word, prayer, and I would stress especially fellowship. Word, prayer, and fellowship. Why don't we all say this together? Word, prayer, and fellowship. Amen. The first, the Word of God. The Bible convicts us of our sins, but does not leave us there. The Bible, the Word of God, point us towards the God who is full of mercy and grace. So God did not help us, did not leave us helpless in our struggle with sin and temptation. You know, we live in a world where we are always wearing various kinds of masks. I don't know about you, but definitely true for me. In the various roles that we play, father, son, friend, employee, you know, Christian, etc. Even as a Christian, you know, we need to dress in a particular way, talk in a particular way, smile in a particular way, walk in a particular way, eat in a particular way, even shake hands in a particular way. Right? We are always portraying what I call professionalism. Professionalism is our default mode. Okay? And we code switch between the roles and the different hats that we wear. Moreover, sometimes we pay compliments to each other. We smile and all, you know, but deep down we want to please everybody. Okay? Because there is an intended effect we want to produce in the interaction with that person. So we don't only need mirrors for our physical appearances or social mirrors to tell us how to behave in certain situations, we need also a mirror for our hearts, for our souls. And the Word of God 
is that mirror for our souls, for our hearts. James 1, 22, 25 reads, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, but not a doer, he is a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The mirror of God's word show us who we really are, especially on the inside, but also what we need to do. And for the purposes of today's sharing, to experience the forgiveness we need. So where we have gone wrong, the word of God tells us how can we be made right. And how forgiving and good God is that we can come to Him to receive His merciful love. So the Word of God, as we are all acquainted, when we listen to a sermon in church or in a podcast, we realise, wow, God is a forgiving God and we can come to Him. When we read our Bibles or we listen to the audio Bible, right, we often will be reminded of the parable of the prodigal son and so many other stories and so many other instances where Jesus forgives sins. Right? The frequency of which forgiveness occurs already tells us something that we truly and deeply need and on a frequent basis. And when we go to Bible studies and realize that from Genesis to Revelation, God has always been faithful to His people, even when so many times His people were unfaithful to Him. God is always ready to forgive when His people return to Him. Return to Him in repentance. Secondly, prayer. Prayer is the privilege to talk to God, to confess our sins to Him, and the greater blessing that He hears us and will answer us. God promised us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness, this reality of forgiveness is available because God has already given us Christ to die for us and He was raised from the dead. So as a reminder for all of us that no matter how grievous or damning our sins are, they can be forgiven if we come to God in godly sorrow and true repentance. But how do we know we are experiencing godly sorrow and true repentance? To help you understand the difference between godly sorrow, true repentance on one hand and worldly sorrow and false repentance on the other, I put up a table. A person who is experiencing godly sorrow and true repentance will be deeply remorseful and not defensive. Someone who is experiencing godly sorrow and true repentance focuses on confessing his or her own sin and doesn't play the blame game. Godly sorrow and true repentance could also lead to a righteous anger with self instead of just angry with someone else, especially when those someone else are the ones that expose our hidden sins. Godly sorrow and true repentance is driven by love. Love that we have hurt the one who gave his life for us. Love that we have hurt the people around us and not simply a fear of consequence. We will be reprimanded, we will be scolded, we will go to jail, will bad things happen to me if I confess my sins? And godly sorrow and true repentance, people who are experiencing that will be willing to make restitution, correction, and want to change. And therefore, by receiving God's forgiveness, because of godly sorrow and true repentance, the effects are long-lived, permanent in fact, instead of the worldly kind that is short-lived. So friends, let us have godly sorrow and come to God in true repentance, for He is so ready to forgive us our sins. Lastly, fellowship. I would say this is perhaps one of the most neglected yet powerful means through which we experience God's forgiveness. In fact, I believe the reason why so many Christians are falling or are tempted to fall or we have repeatedly fallen into sin 
is due to a negligence of fellowship. Have you ever seen animal predators like lions, tigers, wolves, and orcas, uh, which are killer whales, uh, hunt in the wild? One of their key strategies is to separate a targeted prey from its foe, from its group. It doesn't matter if the prey is bigger in size, seemingly stronger. If the prey can be separated from its group of foe, it is a sure kill. Fellowship is the foal, the group, that prevents us from becoming isolated preys to the predators of sin and temptation. That's how important fellowship is. So every Christian must be connected to the fellowship of God. And I would say it is more than just attending Sunday services, more than just attending small group meetings, and way more than just doing Bible studies. Fellowship is deeper than that. In fellowship, there is a sharing of life, sharing of struggles, sharing of hope, sharing of disappointment, sharing of sins through confession, sharing of prayer. There's a deep sharing of lives between one another in the family of God. That is fellowship. And of course, Christ is also at the centre of the fellowship. So it is not a weekend-only thing. It is a continual process, a throughout our life thing. James 5, 16, 19 to 20 reads, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Fellowship is our spiritual covering as we go through the treacherous reality of sin and temptation, which will plague us in this life before Christ returns. God gave us the church to protect us. God gave us one another to look out for one another. And even the first two means of experiencing God's forgiveness, word and prayer, has communal dimensions to it. The fellowship is essentially a word community where we read, pray and speak God's word to one another to encourage one another. The fellowship is also a prayer community where we pray for one another and intercede for one another. You know, one of the greatest temptations and sins that I face, and I want to be really honest that I still do, is in pride manifesting as the need for control, for certainty, things to go my way. Which in fact is actually a form of insecurity or misplaced security because I place that security very often and carnally in myself. So when things don't go my way, I will try to explain it away, right? And if I'll get into an argument with someone, I will strive very hard to prove that I'm right, right? Or at least not wrong. And very often I hurt people with my words and responses. I'm really glad and thankful to God to have fellowship communities that bear with me, that walk with me through life. Namely, my current group of uh, young adults and also a group of Christian peers that I grew up with in church. They accept my weakness. They know my repeated failures. But they extend love, mercy to me and willing to stick it up with me for many years already. They know how to correct me, guide me and love me because when I confess my sins to them, they will know how and where to look out for me. Fellowship is that important. Godly fellowship is a safe and very, very powerful place to be in. And godly fellowship is the loving family to be a part of throughout all eternity. So my friends, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. 
We need to be reminded that Jesus is coming back for you and for me. But in the meantime, He gave us one another. Wow, thank God He gave us one another to care for and support each other. So let's trust God's wisdom and provision of the fellowship so that we can experience forgiveness and, we, and the love we need to sustain us throughout our lives. So friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we must not allow ourselves to be deceived or blinded by our religiosity or good works. Never. Rather, humble self-examination must continually mark our lives. And the good news is that God has given us His Word, prayer, and fellowship to help us examine ourselves and experience the forgiveness we need. So before I end, why not let us pray? Dear Heavenly Father, reveal to us our hypocrisy and help us confront our hidden sins. For sins are what separate you and us. We thank you, God, for the finished work of the cross. And you have given us your word that convicts and guides us unto righteousness. We thank you for the privilege of prayer even now as you hear us. And Lord, you will answer us. Forgive us our sins, Lord. We thank you above all for one another, for Bethany EFC and for the entire church body. Give us the courage, Lord. Lord, give us courage to not only confess our sins to you, but to one another as you grant us godly sorrow and true repentance. And as our brothers and sisters in Christ look out for one another, look out for me, look out for us, we will also look out for them. And may we walk in your ways as we look forward to the day of your glorious return. We also pray, God, that our fellowship with you and with one another will deepen as the days go by. And lastly, Lord, we pray that at the end of the day, we may be found faithful. We pray all these in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church.